What's up, everybody? Welcome to System Crappers Live. I'm David Wilson, and we're back with another Friday stream where we get together as a community and talk about whatever topic I've come up with for the week. And this week is no exception. You'll have to excuse my tongue that seems to not be cooperating with the uh, speaking operation here. Uh, thank you all to those of you who have joined so far. Uh, Glenn Jones, Mark Amalveja, Appenzell, Remastered, uh, Slalom Skater, uh, Dean, uh, Peter, Andre, Technomog, and over in the IRC, we've got, uh, let's see, a lot of folks have been chatting up, up in here. Redacted, Summer Emax, uh, Zororg, Pi the Sailor, Trev. Man, scroll, please. Can you scroll? Thank you. <laughs> Benoit, uh, Jeff, Gun, Fade. Who else is here? Purple G. I think I caught everybody. Uh, uh, Alejandro is in the IRC, I think. And on, back on YouTube side, uh, Bill, Chubby Momo, uh, Christian, uh, Zoli. Yeah, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, Summer uh, normally graces us with a vignette, some kind of uh, you know live, dynamically generated screenplay because Summer's an AI. So uh, today we're not going to get that. That's okay though, because at least it'll be make it easier for me to read the chat. <laughs> Jeff says, uh, "Low vo voice activated scrolling." Yes, no, that's just me being frustrated. Hello to Minas Mazar and Crypt K5. Summer says, I thought I was a spy. Yeah, you, you could be a spy and an AI at the same time. That's possible, I think. I think we'll see more AI spies as time goes on. Zorg says, can anyone share the link? I don't know which link we're talking about here. Um, Yeah, so glad to be back for another uh, stream this week. I always enjoy doing these live streams, hanging out with the community, just chatting on the... Uh, on the interwebs. Uh, we've been having a good time at IRC this week too. So if you're not actually uh, joined up on the System Crafters IRC, you should join up on uh, irc.libra.chat and uh, hit the System Crafters channel there. But right now we're in the System Crafters Dash live channel on IRC. So if you want an alternative way to chat on the stream uh, uh, and not on like Twitch or YouTube, you can definitely hit, hit it up on, um, on IRC. A lot of fun there. Okay, so before we get into the main topic of the day, let me talk about news. Uh, first of all, interesting news this week, Emacs 29.2 has just been released. Uh, usually what happens with Emacs releases is that um, for a long time, there is a an Emacs release in development. Like right now, Emacs 30 is in development, uh, but it's just Emacs 30. Whenever Emacs re release reaches a stable enough point that we want to, or that we, that the maintainers decide that they want to cut a full release that is going to be the, the main stable release, they will say it's like 30.1. And in this case, it was 29.1. I don't know. How long ago was that? Year, year and a half? Um, but uh, now we've got 29.2, which is basically just, you know, minor bug fixes and improvements. Uh, so Eli Zaretsky, who is uh, uh, one of the main maintainers, on uh, Emacs sent out an announcement this week. Yeah, you can see all my NVIDIA uh, driver research I was doing today. Um, just basically notifying people about the new release. Uh, it often takes a while before the new versions show up in the package repos of the various distributions. But if you're on like, you know, Geeks or Arch Linux or maybe Alpine or Gen 2 or one of the you know, more bleeding as distros, you should see 29.2 available to you. And if you're also on a Mac, you probably will get the latest thing on, um, what's it called? Homebrew? Whatever you use to install software on Mac. I don't know anymore. <laughs> um, so uh, let's quickly just run through what the actual news is for this release. Uh, kind of interesting to see what's been changed. I don't know how much is here. I haven't really looked at it yet. Uh, let's see, startup changes. Uh, if you use org, um, a lot and you have org protocol integration set up, like maybe your browser has a button you can use to share things from your browser to org mode in Emacs. Uh, you no longer have to register Emacs as the org protocol handler. Apparently in Linux, at least, uh, that's set up by default. So anytime you 
uh, launch Emacs client with the org protocol link, it will just, uh, or the desktop will automatically acknowledge Emacs client is as the program to use for org protocol links. I believe this is what it's saying. So uh, you don't have to do that extra configuration step, which is pretty nice. Um, also, let's see, tramps, got some changes, new user option. I don't know anything about that. Incompatible Lisp changes uh, with SQLite transaction. Ooh, so there's like actual SQLite functions in Emacs now. That'd be pretty cool uh, with SQLite. So SQLite. All right, so there's like a whole SQLite library. It makes sense because SQLite is built in now, but I, I didn't actually know that there was a full API for it. That's kind of interesting, actually. Some new stuff there. Um, let's see. On non-free operating systems. Ooh, scary. Uh, let's see. Uh, installation changes. Ahead of time compilation can now be requested by a configure. Fine. Uh, Emacs can be, can be built with a tree sitter parsing library. Oh, wait, hold on. This is 29.1. Okay. Is that right? Are we done with 29.2? That must be it. Okay, anyway. Um, so not too much, it seems. Probably there's a lot more like small things here and there that got fixed that uh, didn't really make the list, but that's just how it goes. Uh, so definitely get that installed if you're still on uh, Emacs 29 and you have access to 29.2. Probably it will be a little bit better, a little bit more stable, et cetera, et cetera. Big update, says Pi the Sailor. Yeah, it's, it's huge. It took me so long to read that. Cool. Uh, next thing is, um, last week I announced that I would be um, trying a new thing, which was to create a live interactive course. Uh, it was called the Hands-On Guile Scheme for, for Beginners course. Um, I'm very proud and happy to say that I've actually got a full course registration uh, so far. So in, in a week, I had enough people registered that it reached, actually surpassed the limit of who, how many people I thought I would get in a class or thought I could you know, have together in a class. So I decided to just turn off registrations for now because I don't want to have way too many people. Um, but I'm super, super thankful to all of you who've signed up so far. I'm really excited about this because it's the first time I'm doing this and I think it's going to be really good. Um, I've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes to get everything ready. Um, I've also started working on the material, which is, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a fun course. I'm really excited to do it. I hope that those of you who signed up are, are uh, excited to get started. I'm going to send out an email probably on Monday to propose some times uh, for people to choose from to see, you know, whether there's like maybe a single time that would be good for most people, or if there, there's a couple times, I really don't really know how I'll do that yet, but I think the best way to go is for me to just sort of pick maybe three different times or days and people can sort of vote on them. Uh, those of you who signed up for the course, it's not mandatory to be live on the sessions, but I want as many people to join live as, as they want. So um, I'm definitely gonna work that out however, however I can. Um, but for those of you who wanted to sign up and didn't get to sign up this time, the next iteration should happen in March or April. It really just depends on how things go. Um, I'm sure they'll go fine, but I, I kind of need to like see if there's any changes I need to make to how things work before I uh, start up a second one. But I might go ahead and do it anyway. So maybe probably in, maybe probably, in the second week of March, I'll uh, send out something about uh, registrations if we're going to be doing uh, another iteration of course in March, or, sorry, in February. I'll sit on the second week of February, I will probably send out an email about registrations for March if that's how it's going to go. Otherwise, it will be in April. So sign up for the uh, newsletter, systemcutters.net slash newsletter to be notified whenever uh, that information is um, uh, sent out. And uh, I will definitely be planning more advanced courses. I've been talking to a few people about, you know, things they would be looking for in a more advanced Guile course, the intermediate to advanced. I'm not sure exactly how many I'm gonna do just yet. Um, there's a bunch of different ideas though. So there's there's sort of any number of things we could do. So if you have thoughts on what you would like to see in an intermediate or advanced course, or one that's geared more towards geeks specifically, uh, definitely let me know either in the comments or via IRC, email, whatever, uh, Macedon, Betaverse. And uh, I, I'm definitely planning to get something else going. So may, maybe another, uh, another course in March or April that is a more advanced one. Hopefully I will learn enough from the beginner course in February that I can sort of streamline that one for a second second run and then do another course in parallel. That's sort of the idea I have in mind. Maybe have two courses running in parallel. Um, 
we'll see how how well that goes but that's that's what i want to do all right uh the next thing is that i am going to be giving a keynote at libra planet 2024 i mentioned it a few times on the channel so far but i wanted to remind people because uh recently they announced that it would be may 4th and 5th they finally have a date established for it it's going to be at the wentworth institute of technology in boston massachusetts um, there's a link here with more information about that. Um, you can go to libreplanet.org 2024, and you can register now to be there either in person or to attend the conference online. So if you don't want to have to go to Boston, um, then you can definitely, you know, watch all of the talks online if you want to. Um, I will be there in Boston in person. So I would love to meet any of, any of you who do want to go to Boston for the conference and uh, show up there. Um, I'm starting to think a little bit about maybe organizing a little meetup outside of the conference. I'm not, exa not exactly sure what day that would be, but you know, maybe to meet up at like a coffee shop somewhere and just you know, chat about system crafting, geek Guile, Emacs, et cetera, et cetera. Or maybe just uh, life things that have nothing to do com with computers. Who knows? Maybe we'll be human beings and not uh, computer addicts. Hello to Dave, I see you joining the channel there. Okay, um, I think that's it. Any other news that people can think of? And while you're thinking about that, I will check the chat. Let's see. Uh, Chubby Momo says, uh, kind of curious how you personally avoid the dreaded Emacs pinky. I personally have my caps lock key be escape when pressed and control when held. Uh, I have caps lock bound to control. That helps a lot. Uh, I don't have the sort of dual operation of, of escape also. I kind of do want that though, because it would be a lot more efficient than me hitting escape. But... I have such muscle memory tied to just slamming escape with my middle finger, like sort of reaching up and just slamming it, that it was probably going to be hard to break that. Yeah, you kind of have to use caps lock at control, as control. And if you go look at the uh, Space Cadet original keyboard, is that what it's called? Or am I thinking of the wrong thing? Oh, yeah, there it is. So, is that the right keyboard? No. There's a keyboard that was used for to develop Emacs that had control where the pinky would be and not down at the bottom, I think. Not the Space Cadet. <laughs> Benoit is having a, a negative reaction to pulling up the Space Cadet. Um, it's probably not that one. There was another one that had that. Uh, let's see, Tico keyboard. Uh, uh, caps lock. There's one, I saw a picture. Okay. Did the Space Cadet keyboard really have control where the caps lock is now? Is this like a an urban legend? Rub out key. Okay. So big it needs wheels. Yeah, it looks pretty damn massive. That's for sure. It's too big. And extremely dusty. It must have come like that out of the factory because, you know, if you're using a Lisp, then you're already a dinosaur. So you got to have a really dusty keyboard to uh, do your job, right? Uh, Zororg says, can we expect an Emacs Android stream anytime? You know, actually, that's more possible than you would think now that I've learned about some tools that I can use to make that happen to share uh, an Android device screen on the stream. So it is possible, certainly possible. But I really haven't used the official Emacs build uh, on Android much yet because uh, I need to, like, craft a configuration for that when i say craft i really mean craft because it's not really that usable with a phone keyboard so you kind of need to have a, a good configuration setup summer says if you do an android stream <laughs> you need to do an ios stream equal access laws and all that well there's no official emacs build on ios so that's the reason why we couldn't do that purple she says rub out yeah that, that must mean like delete I don't want to think about what other meanings I could have. See ya, Bill. Thanks for joining. Hello to Walter Zhang. All right. Uh, Paul Victor says uh, you should uh, try a K-Monad. Yeah, K-Monad seems pretty cool. And it also another program that can be configured with a Lisp-style syntax. It's, it's S, S expressions, but it's not really like a programming language, I think. But it's good enough, you know. Okay. So, that's enough looking at that picture. Um, was that it? 
How did we get there? I think I was reading chat. That's how it happened. I didn't check the IRC though. I need to get the uh, Twitch bridge set back up again so that I can actually see all the chat in one place. Landfill says, I use an ergonomic Atreus, Atreus keyboard. Yeah, that's pretty cool. By uh, Technomancy, I think. Uh, Gun says, the famous Emacs foot meta alt escape USB foot pedal needs yet to be invented. Well, you could definitely get uh, foot pedals for Emacs. Just go on Amazon. You could definitely find a foot pedal that you could bind to a key. It could be useful. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, Advantage 3 keyboard is where it's at. Uh, yeah, the, the Kinesis keyboards are uh, pretty wacky. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's a great idea, but for me, like, I've, I've tried using non-standard keyboard designs before, and it's always difficult switching back and forth between that and a, uh, what do you call it? Normal keyboard layout. Okay, so I want to try a little experiment. Uh, those of you who were in System Crafters IRC yesterday already probably saw this, but I'm going to try it again just to see what happens. Um, I've been looking at this tool called Video Ninja. It's basically a website that makes it easy to set up uh, conferencing. Actually, video calls or screen sharing, a lot of different things. It's actually kind of like a Swiss Army knife for uh, transferring video between machines. Uh, what I want to do is if, if there are those of you here who have uh, a device with a microphone and or keyboard, or Jesus Christ, uh, camera, video camera, you can tell that it's late. Uh, I want you to join this link. Now, this link, um, let me see if I can post it in the chat. Let me go to the other side here. I'm going to drop it in the IRC. It's not going to go across, is it? Let me see if I can get it into the... Uh... It's also in the show notes if you go in the uh, description. Let me just pull that out real quick. I don't want you to have to type this in directly because it would be really annoying to do that. So we're just going to try to see how many people, if possible, to just get into a little call here. Because I want to test the scale of it. It may just kill the stream entirely, but uh, hopefully it won't. If it starts to, to choke, then I'll just restart the stream. Okay, there's the link. And let me go to OBS and pull that up now. Uh, let me also go to IRC and drop in the link. There we go. Close that. And we'll see if anybody shows up in the little pane. So what, what happens here is you go to this website and you turn on your microphone and camera or, you know, one or the other. You don't have to turn on your, vi your video if you don't want. You will be seen on the screen, on the stream. I should, I should say that. If you turn your video on, you will be seen. So uh, hello to uh, Tethno. Can you hear me? There we go. <laughs> Ashras needs to catch up there. Okay. I don't know. Maybe, let's see. Okay, there's Jeff. There's Pi. Can anybody speak and see if I can hear you? Oh, you know what? I'm not in the room. Can anybody speak and see if I can hear you? Okay, I can hear myself. Hello, hello. Someone else's one, two, three. Hello. I'm here. <laughs> Let me grab mine. I, hey I didn't grab my own link. I heard you. Hello, hello, testing one, two, three. Hello. I'm here. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Grab mine. Hello, hello. I, didn't grab my own link. I heard you. <laughs> All right, we got a whole little loop going on with the sound. Let me hello. see if I can. Oh, there's like a, quite a delay, though. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. hello. Interesting that I'm not getting. Hello. Oh, there's like quite a delay though. It's like half a minute at least, maybe 60 seconds. It's going great so far. Where is my link? It's like half a minute at least, maybe 60 seconds. So Has the stream died yet? Okay, uh, let's see. 
Sorry, folks. Give me one second. I have to actually get into the room so that I can speak and that people can hear me. Come on, come on, come on. Content. Yes, we've got so many people on the screen now. Yeah, I just want to get it working. I'm starting to lag, yeah, because I, I just opened up Firefox. That's why. Goodness. All right, can I find the link? Link, 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 link. Should have pulled this up beforehand. Sorry, folks. Okay, I think it's about to happen now. <laughs> Nope. All right. Anyway, that was fun. Well, thank you to uh, to Fade, to B Foley, Zoli, Paul, Pi the Sailor, Jeff, Benoit. I can't see if anybody else's name is down there. But uh, I'm gonna go ahead and kill this thing now because I don't want it to, to die entirely. But the video seems like it's going fairly smoothly um, from from the participants. So that's that's more or less encouraging for me. That's what seven people. Okay. We'll see what happens when I get thirty people up in here. <laughs> I don't know how well it's gonna work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Ben Wafade. All right, give me a second. Let me turn this thing off now. Uh, let me remove that. Yeah, let's remove it. There we go. Okay. All right, so we're back to normal. Everything good? Stream still on? Thank you for indulging my little experiment there. I hope it works. Okay. So, um, <laughs> you should check out Video Ninja if you ever have to do any kind of um, um, video calling between people because it's actually a peer-to-peer -peer connection between your browsers. Kind of weird that it does like that, but it's uh, WebRTC if you know anything about that. And uh, it's very easy to share screens too, like super high quality screen sharing. In fact, what you see on um, the screen right now, like my actual Emacs, um, window is on a different computer and I'm streaming that to my streaming machine using uh, Video Ninja. Red Bull gives you wings. Yeah, Red Bull gives you the inability to speak. Uh, Redacted says, how does it compare to meet.jit.c? So the Jitsi uh, site. So Jitsi is not super reliable in my experience. Like even a call with three people, um, it, the quality drops out a lot. Screen sharing quality is pretty low. I don't really, it, it's not a problem really with Jitsi itself. Maybe it's just the server, but, um, sorry, I saw something in chat. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I thought about using Jitsi for this, but then I wanted to look into something else. So I think this might be actually better. Uh, Akite says, how is Video Ninja going? It's going great but I need to uh, do a little bit more experimentation with it, I think. I have a better setup on my other machine to uh, to use it in a group call. It was a little bit uh, on the fly here, so anyway. So let's get into the actual topic of the day, which is to check out some Guile Scheme libraries. So since we're gonna be talking about Guile more on the channel this year, I thought it might be useful to scan through the list of Guile libraries and programs that use Guile to see sort of what we can do with the language. And to give you a taste of, um, you know, things that give you some ideas about things you might want to do with it as well. So if we have time, we might actually try to write a simple test application using some of these libraries, since many of them are wired up in Git, or sorry, in Geeks as Geeks packages. But um, we'll see, because there's quite a long list of uh, Guile packages and programs in this website. So we'll, we'll see uh, how far we can get. All right, so I'm going to use EWW to load up this list. And let's see if we can actually get there. Cool. So this is quite a long page, but um, it's got a lot of really interesting stuff in it. So what I thought we would do is just sort of cruise down through the list and just talk about the different things that we can see uh, here and maybe make a list of things that we might want to investigate a little bit further. So um, first of all, there is a library called 8sync. 
And it's an asynchronous programming li library for GNU Guile based on the actor model. This was actually written by Christine Limmer Weber, the uh, founder of the Sprightly Institute, a uh, well-known uh, GNU and Guile hacker and Geeks hacker, it's, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Also the uh, co-author of the activity pub specification, lots of uh, background there. Um, let me see. I don't know if this website is going to look good in in EWW, but ah, oh, crap. Let's see. All right, let me pull it back up again. Was it gnu.org slash s eight sync? So if you've never heard of the actor model before, it's basically a concurrent programming model uh, where you have different actors, like they're basically like, like nodes in the code, and they uh, have their own separate line of execution so they sort of have their own little loop that's going on and they send messages between each other and uh technically speaking the operation of these is supposed to be happening in, uh, concurrently not really necessarily in parallel it could be parallel too if they're on different threads but um it's just a different way to write applications another aspect of the actor model is that you should be able to have an actor that's in a different process or maybe in a different location on the network or on the internet etc um and i don't know if this Library goes to that degree, but it might. But if you want a better example of this, you should look into Sprightly Goblins because Sprightly, Sprightly Goblins is, is like the like the next generation of what you would do with something like an actor model. So um, this is kind of cool. If you've ever, ever wanted to write some code with the actor model before, there's a scheme library, library for that for Guile. Um, we could try to, to mess with that a little bit later, but I don't really know if it's something we want to do live. Uh, Jeff says, it's popularized, if I recall, by Erlang. Uh, yeah, Erlang uh, definitely had a uh, sort of a fault-tolerant design. I'm not, exa not exactly sure if it's a, uh actor model, but it might be. But actor model is definitely in a lot of places. I, I studied that a bit while using the F-sharp programming language because they have a... It's not actually called actors, but it's like a message box implementation, which is kind of like actors. I can't remember. It's been a while. If you've, if you've watched the very first videos on this channel, I was actually talking about F-sharp and wrote some code with uh, actor model with that, but that was a long time ago. So anyway, 8sync, it definitely seems pretty cool. If you want to just take a little quick look at this code. Um, so define class, I think that comes from Goops. That's something that's built into Guile. It's object-oriented programming. Summer says, did he say anything interesting? Never, never. Uh, let's see, we got a method here. That's a, a Goops method, it looks like. And there must be... Where is the actual code? Maybe, maybe this is actually things that are coming from the 8sync library. I'm not going to look at this for, for too long. There's too much to look at, but let's just take a look real quick. Uh, define method. Okay, so I see Goops here. So definitely define methods coming from Goops. Oh, okay. So we've got an, an actor here, run bot, make hive. That must be coming from 8sync. So once you have a hive, if you call bootstrap actor on the hive, you give it an object. Okay. Interesting. Well, there's probably, we're not going to go through the docs. We can look at this separately on a whole stream at some point in the, uh, in, in the future. Uh, Fade says, is Goops uh, CLOS for Guile? Yes, more or less. I mean, Scheme does things a little bit differently, but <laughs> Cal2001 says, close, but no cigar. That was a good one. Uh, Daniel42 says, inventor of actor model Carl Hewitt passed away recently. Was it, was it Carl Hewitt who invented that? R.I.P. What's going on with all the uh, computer science and, and internet uh, creators asking recently? I guess it's just like inevitable with the age of the internet and, and these kind of programming models. Okay, next, ACD bus. We should have ACDW here to talk about this. He's not here and he has nothing to do with this, but because it has the first three letters of his nick, then he's obviously qualified. So this is a D bus um client library maybe it's also a server library too but basically dbus is the communication bus that's used on uh, linux systems or unix 
I don't know. Maybe Dbus is on BSD too, I'm not sure. But anyway, it's on uh, Unix-like systems and it facilitates communication between applications. Uh, also discovery of services and discovery of the, uh, the types and the operations that those services expose. So basically it gives your whole system an organized way to communicate between processes and also to facilitate uh, common protocols. So like the desktop environment protocol or you know other various things that uh, any application could respond to, you know, like a screenshot app. Maybe there's like a, an API for screenshot apps and then you have a screenshot app that can plug into it. And then any other app that wants to take a screenshot can send a message over Dbus and tell that app to take a screenshot. So there's, there's value to this, but it is kind of esoteric for a lot of people because it's not something that's very visible and you don't really know why it's necessary until you really start digging into it. Uh, if you want to hear more about Dbus, we did do a stream maybe last year sometime talking about how to interact with Dbus services using Emacs because Emacs has its own libraries for this. Uh, but this is a library apparently for um, interacting with Dbus services and probably um, exposing Dbus services. I would imagine that you should be able to register a Dbus service using this library because Guile applications are full applications. They should be able to participate in the um, Dbus system. So... Um, if you want an interesting idea for how you could use this, uh, different systems in Linux, like let's say Network Manager for controlling your uh, network devices or even like uh, Bluetooth devices or um, uh, like u disky or U-Disks for m mounting devices. All of these things have their own Dbus interfaces that you can interact with. So you could write uh, Guile applications that uh, interact with those services and and do things with them. Now, maybe there's simpler ways to do that. Maybe you could run command line applications to to uh, make some of these changes, but it's just an idea. Like if you wanted to experiment with Dbus, write an application that does something useful, uh, there, there's any number of services that you could talk to in Dbus to, uh, to, to figure it out. Uh, Fade says Dbus locks things to Linux and possibly BSD, but definitely not Mac OS and Windows. Yeah, I don't think it's on... Um, when, it was definitely not on Windows unless you're in WSL. I wonder, is uh, Dbus MSYS? Yeah, MSYS, right? Well, there is a Dbus package for MingW. So maybe if you use uh, MSYS2, then you can have uh, Dbus. But I don't know if that's something that Windows processes can interact with unless they're also being built with MingW or MSYS2. I don't know. It's a possibility. But yeah, uh, Mac OS, well, Mac OS might also have it. So let's see, Mac OS Dbus. Is there an equivalent to Dbus on Mac OS? You can install it via Homebrew. So maybe it's on all platforms, but it just won't be as useful on other platforms, I think, because it's not you know commonly used. Uh, Afro says KDE Connect might use Dbus and is available for Windows. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, what have we got over in the other screen here? Tim says, I think the Erlang folks developed the actor model independently. Later folks observed that it is essentially an implementation of the actor model. Okay, so it's like a similar thing they implemented, basically. Uh, and Jackson says, Erlang has an actor model. It uses letterboxes to send messages between processes. It can have thousands of processes running and its own lightweight processes, much lighter than any other language. Um, and the model is designed to fail in controlled ways. Uh, Jackson says, I coded Erlang back in 1994 in Uppsala University, and we did have several projects, and Uni made a better compiler than Ericsson. That's cool. Hello to Itaiko. I'm doing well. I hope you are, too. Oh, it's uh, Talos. Nice. Talos, you should be in the systemcrafters-live chat on IRC. All right. So uh, next, th this is going to go super slowly. I can already tell. AGI Bio. Some of these are not going to be super interesting to this audience, so we will skip over them. This is a package for genomic and proteomic research using the OpenCog tool set with Guile. There's probably some of you here who are doing bioinformatics and things of that nature, and this would be useful to you. But for me, not so much. Also worth noting, uh, there are Guile versions listed for some of these, maybe all of these. Uh, keep in mind that the current version of Guile being used in most places is Guile 3, so you should make sure you have Guile 2.2 if you want to use some of these libraries. So that that is probably useful in someone, but maybe not so interesting for us. Um, let's see, AISCM, 
AI scheme, I guess is what it's for, um, is a guile extension for numerical arrays and tensors. Performance is achieved by using the LLVM JIT compiler. That sounds pretty cool. Um, sounds like it's made for um, doing big matrix math. Uh, probably like SciPy. Is that what that what is? SciPy? Am I wrong about that? Not exactly. SciPy is something different. There's another library. What is it? Yeah. NumPy? Yeah, NumPy. I think it's NumPy. That This may be sort of like that, but I don't really know for sure. Uh, but I think the, the point there is that you should be able to use this library for doing AI development because there's lots of massive matrices and arrays, etc., that you need to crunch to uh, do what is necessary for uh, language models. Ashra says BLAS and Fade says C bindings to BLAS. What is BLAS? I don't know what it is. Uh, there we go. Basic linear algebra subprograms. Is that it? It could be. Performing, performing basic vector and matrix operations. So if you're in college right now and you're taking linear algebra, uh, you should play around with that maybe. <laughs> Uh, Peter says, I used, I remember I used Dbus on Mac when I daily drove one in the past. That's cool. Uh, no, uh, Talos, we haven't gotten a haunt yet. Uh, Isle Riot. So the solitaire game for Gnome called Isle Riot, which I have played too many times, apparently has a, uh, a scheme scripting interface. I'm guessing that this is how they add new game modes to it, but I don't really know for sure. But it's kind of cool that it does have a Guile interface. And this is kind of like the original purpose of Guile. The original purpose of Guile was to be a, an embeddable language in C programs to provide basically an Emacs-like scripting interface for arbitrary programs. Um, there's a number of GNU programs like GNU Cache, LilyPond, Isle Riot, and others that are going to be in this list which do use Guile as a scripting or configuration language. So it's kind of interesting if you think about learning Guile for the purpose, not only of writing applications and you know building your own tools, but also extending other applications in an Emacs-like way. So um, definitely worth checking that out. I haven't really done anything with that, but it might be cool. Maybe on a stream one day when we're bored, we can just hack on some, uh, some games using Guile. Uh, Daniel says, there was also a war between Guile and Tickle. That's pretty funny. I think I remember reading some stuff about that. It was called the Tickle Wars. Yeah, the Tickle Wars. Goodness. I wouldn't want to be involved in that. Okay, so uh, next is Aku. Aku.sem is a project-based language package manager for R6RS and R7RS scheme. Um, so if you've used a package manager, like let's say uh, NPM or Cargo or... Um, what else? What I don't know what you use on Haskell. Python has uh, what is it called for Python? I've forgotten. I'm I'm a bad programmer. <laughs> uh, but anyway, Aku is basically that, but for multiple scheme implementations. So it can pull down scheme libraries, and it also I think it includes like little tweaks and patches to provide compatibility between the different scheme implementations because they're all different in their own ways, even though there's a single language uh, spec. So uh, this could be a useful tool for people who want to pull down libraries. Uh, for me as a scheme programmer, I often just avoid using libraries as much as possible and just write things myself if I can. But Guile makes that a bit easier, especially with geeks involved. Uh, if you use Geeks, you don't really need to use Aku. Well, let's say, let's say this. If you use Geeks and Guile, you don't need to use Aku because Geeks is going to be better for what you need to do. But Aku could be pretty good for uh, wider wider applic applicability scheme development. What's the uh, website for that? Let's see. All right. So yeah, package management made easy, and it's like what you would expect to see. You can search for packages, install them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and a number of schemes are supported. Um, it does depend on whether which, which scheme language spec that the libraries target, obviously. And it also is supported on number number of platforms. <laughs> Tim says, uh, not tickle fight, missed opportunity there. Yes, maybe back then they wouldn't have thought about that. Uh, a kite says pip and hackage. Yes. 
those are the ones I was thinking of. Wolf JB says, uh, I like Tickle, not as much as a Lisp language, but uh, my GUI is Tickle plus LTK. Oh, oh, CL. Okay. Common Lisp. Gotcha. Fade says, Tickle is a weird language. TK, t TK is useful due to ubiquity. Um, I have not used it. I keep hearing about how nice it is for building, you know, quick little UI tools and stuff, but uh, yeah. All right, next, Alive. You can do Alive since periodic pings to a server generally to keep a connection alive. So someone out there who does systems administration, can you tell me why this is useful? Why would you need to ping a server to keep a connection alive? Um, you Can I copy a link? Yank, bookmark yank, no, copy, page URL, yank. Anyway, uh, GNU Alive. Dave says, I've never used such a thing. Yeah, I don't really, this must be something that was needed a long time ago in a land far, far away. Fade says, a lot of SSH demons are configured to close a socket on inactivity. Okay. Oh, what did I click? Uh, okay, uh, Peter says, e.g. VPN auto disconnect. Okay, so it's like that kind of connection alive situation. Paul says, to keep the firewalls in between to keep the uh, connections alive. All right, so this is basically just a uh, highfalutin way to write a simple ping script. Um, I think it doesn't even say it somewhere. Anyway, you could just write a, a bash script that just runs ping and loops it over and over and over. Or just let ping run, just call ping. It just runs forever, doesn't it? Anyway, but since we're on the channel, which talks about doing things the hard way for no reason, there's, there you go. There's a, a Gaia library for pinging servers. CTOID says, I think in order to use a WebSocket as a Discord bot, you need to ping the API periodically known as a heartbeat, okay? Ashra says, a bash script, but this is Guile. Yes, exactly. You could even shell out the ping from Guile if you wanted to. Uh, Jeff says, could write a bash script. That's not near as fun as doing it with Guile. Yeah, I know, right? But this is one thing I would just be like, I'm just going to use ping, the ex executable. Anubis. Anubis is a demon that sits between the mail user agent and the mail transfer agent. Um, so it's basically like a program that could filter emails that are going out. Is it? Is the MUA and the MTA for things going out or going in? When a mail is sent by a user in the MUA, it is first passed to Anubis. Okay, so it's like thing, you can screw with the emails a little bit before they go out, apparently. Which could be useful for people who are um, managing a mail server. Benoit says, you could do Babashka instead. Yeah, you could probably could do that. <laughs> Ashraz has to give the most ridiculous way to do this possible, which is to... Uh, Use Guile to run ping.exe through Wine. That is evil. You'll also be burning unnecessary CPU cycles. I, actually, it's probably not that bad, right? Gun says, Anubis is for stupid uh, male disclaimers. You know, that's actually interesting. I hadn't thought about that. If you, if you like have a law firm and you want every single email to have that disclaimer at the bottom, then... Um, you could use that to just jam it on the end of each email body. Okay, Artanis. This is something that could be interesting. I haven't really played with it much, but it is a web application framework written in Guile. Um, so if you've used uh, like Ruby on Rails or Django or other um, sort of full web application frameworks in the more traditional sense, in like the mid 2000s sense, where you have a server side application that creates pages from templates. You have like, you know, uh, a database with maybe some models built in the language that map to the database entries and you have like views and controllers and the whole MVC thing. Um, I think this is more in that style of application. I haven't really used it much. I've looked at the documentation, it seems to have quite a lot of functionality in it. So if you want to write web applications, like full web applications with sessions and database activity, I, or whatever. Um, Artanis could be a good choice for that. Let me see if I can pull that up. Okay, so GNU Artanis. Come on. 
Um, all right, so this is not the, I, I've seen a different website for this. I don't think this is the main website for uh, China's, but it's got a lot of stuff in it. So if you want to check that out, definitely check that out. Okay, so uh, Atom Space says in RAM knowledge representation database, uh, an associated query engine and graph rewriting system, rule driven inferencing engine. Sounds pretty specific. I don't know what it's for, but this is another open cog thing. What is open cog? It's the second time we've seen that. So AI stuff. Okay. Yeah. I'll hold my comments. Um, cool. Attention. Uh, Attention. Allocation is an open cog subsystem. There's a lot of AI stuff being written with Guile, apparently. Meant to control the application of processing of memory resources to specific tasks. Okay. So it's like uh, cog cognition. Attention as it relates to cognition. Cool. Autogen. Program to ease and maintenance of programs that contain large amounts of repetitive text. Automates the construction of these sections in the code. Uh, simplifying the task of keeping the text in sync. So, I've heard of Autogen. Text and program generation tool. Is this, it's not like Automate though, is it? Large amounts of repetitious text. It's like a templating engine almost. Um, it's like a fact. That is not the kind of fact I'm looking for. Uh, creating and maintaining code required for processing program options. Okay, I see. So it's like a code generation tool. So if you want to uh, not have to write a bunch of fidgety code for, or fiddly code for, um, handling command line options in C, then you could have a higher level language just generate that code for you. Gun says, autoconf, automake, or the build system helpers. Yes. All right, so. AVR, GDB. Okay, so it's the GNU debugger. Uh, da, 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 da. This variant of GDB can be used to debug programs written for the AVR microcontroller architecture. I think GDB may be in this list in general. Yeah. So, GDB Guile script. You can extend GDB using Guile. Only available if GDB was compiled with Guile. That's kind of cool, though. I wonder if you if it's easier to use that for automating certain debugging tasks, uh, and not just the just using like the command interface inside of GDB. Yes, the GNU debugger. If you write uh, native code applications, uh, you would probably end up using GDB at some point if you're on Linux. Yeah, it works pretty well. I mean, I've used it quite a bit. Next, BATS is a TAP compliant testing com framework for Bash. It provides a simple way to verify that Unix programs you write behave as expected. Most useful when testing software written in Bash. I like how they call it software written in Bash. Would you want to use any software written in Bash? Okay, I would use a script written in Bash, but software? I would say the most elaborate software I've ever seen written in Bash is called xmake.sh. Yeah. This thing's pretty cool, actually, though. It's basically just a self-contained make tool. Well, it, it wraps make, but it's sort of like a, it's like CMake, but written in Bash. And if that sounds awful to you, well, I mean, it's kind of scary, frightening. How many lines is this? That's not it. No, that is not it. Where is it? Come on. Did I miss it? Oh, it's okay. It's, it's written as configure. Okay, so basically 4,385 lines of bash. And uh, if you try to maintain this, which actually I've, I've con contributed fixes. Where is it? Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Yes, see, there's me right there. I actually contributed this project. I actually went through this script and figured out how to add mscripted, mscripten support to it. But anyway, point being, this is a CMake-like bash script that can you can write a simple 
configuration named xmake.sh to describe your project and then you can use that to build your native code applications basically. It's an offshoot of this larger xmake uh, project where you, uh, it's written in Lua and it's a lot more powerful. But anyway, point being, where did that, how did I get there? Yes, Bash software. That is the most elaborate Bash software I've ever seen, but I don't think I would want to go any further than that. So if you have Bash software, you need to test. You can use bats, and apparently bats can be scripted in a uh, file scheme. Bats core. If you write Bash, you need bats because you have a haunted house. Um, tap compliant testing framework. So it is literally Bash code. No, no, no. Hold on. What is this? It looks like bash code. I don't know if it actually is bash code. Where does Guile come into this? I don't see anything about Guile here. This is a joke. <laughs> There's literally nothing about Guile in this repo, so I have no idea why this is here. There must be a reason. Okay, anyway. Camel boot. Oh, camel is written in Oh, camel. Oh, camel, my camel. Its sources contain a pre-compiled bytecode version of Oh, camel C and Oh, camel Lex that are used to build the next version of the compiler. Camel boot implements a bootstrap for the OCaml compiler and provides a bootstrap equivalent to these files. Um, okay, so it's a basically an OCaml compiler written in Scheme, which is cool. So it's basically just using Guile. I don't think this is, this is not official by any means. I don't think. But it's, it's mentioned. Oh, it's an experiment. All right, gotcha. 87 stars. So n not, you know, super high profile. That's cool though. Carla, now if you've done any um, audio production in uh, Linux before, you've probably heard of Carla. It's basically an audio plugin host where you can plug in different VSTs and wire them together. Um, it's kind of a Swiss Army, Swiss Army knife of sorts. So um, apparently you can script it with Guile, which is kind of cool. I didn't know that. I might actually use that functionality at some point in the future. But um, let's see, Carla Linux. Yep. Fully featured modular audio plugin host. And if you don't know what a plugin host is, it's basically a program that can load up VSTs and then wire them into another. Uh, well, you don't necessarily need to have like a music program, like let's say Ardor or Z Rhythm or anything like that. I think this can be used standalone. So it's not really like a DAW, a digital audio workstation where you're composing music. It's just a, a program where you can have plugins set up, wire them together, and play with them a little bit, I guess. You can tell that I haven't actually used this. But anyway, you can script that with Guile. CCWL. Uh, all right, let's skip that. So some kind of workflow syntax. Let's talk about Chickadee, which is very nice because Dave is here. Uh, Chickadee is a game development toolkit for Guile scheme built on top of SDL2 and OpenGL. Um, and it's, it's quite nice. I've used it a little bit. And in fact, Probably the first Guile code I tried to write, I was using Chickadee to try to write a Mahjong game. Um, and it was quite nice. But I also did not know much about Scheme back then. So it was, uh, I wasn't doing a very good job with it. I didn't understand the idioms of the language yet. But um, as usual, you have the nice David Thompson style uh, documentation or uh, yeah, documentation page, etc. And uh, if you want to do any game development with Guile, I would highly recommend checking out Chickadee first because it's got pretty much everything you need. And Dave has used it uh, for different game jams, I believe. So um, co a cool project to check out uh, for game development with, uh, with Guile. Clip menu, some, put something in the clipboard. What does it have to do with Guile? Okay, you can, you can look at that on your own if you want. Cog server. OpenCog, COG server is a network of job server for the OpenCog framework. Okay. Uh, Dave mentions, uh, hopefully coming to the web this year. Yes, uh, Chickadee should be working in the browser with Guile Hoot as well. So if you want to write Guile games for the browser with an actual uh, game engine library, you can do that. Uh, soon, not now. Uh, how do you pronounce this word? Queerus? Cheerus? Kiris? Not sure exactly how you pronounce it, but it's actually a kind of an interesting project. Um, it is a 
CI software, continuous integration software that uses Geeks. It's written in Guile and it uses Geeks for the actual builds of the programs involved. It's being used for Geeks and the Geeks build farm. So anytime you download a substitute package from Geeks, like the pre-made, pre-built binary packages that you get from Geeks, it actually comes from, it's been, those have been built using Quiris, Curis, Curess. <laughs> oh God, I'm not gonna read that. Thanks, Gun. I appreciate the translation. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> sorry. So uh, it actually is pretty nice. Like the UI is nice on this. It's surprisingly well constructed for um, a uh, Guile application for geeks. You would think it would be a little bit more um, brutalist, I guess you could say. But no, it's, it's pretty good. So let's see. Where is that? Master? Is that the, all the normal geeks packages? Now, we're not going to really dig into this too much, but the point is that you can configure your CI jobs, et cetera, using Guile, I'm pretty sure, with, uh, with Curis. Let me check the manual real quick. HTML, jobs, blah, blah, blah. Show me some scheme. Where is the scheme? I'm not seeing it. Ah, uh, that's configuring uh, geeks. Not the same. Uh, okay, I think this is something. Here we go. Yeah, you write specifications for your jobs. The main curious argument is a specification file. It describes the repositories that must be used to build jobs and their priorities between other things. So I think that uh, Ludo wrote a blog post. Geeks blog uh, Ludovic uh, continuous integration. Yeah. Uh, this is a really cool blog post from development environments to continuous integration, the ultimate guide to software development with geeks. Um, you'll really get the most of it by using Curis, a CI tool designed for and tightly integrated with geeks. Uh, it's more work than as host a CI tool. Sure. But you can basically configure it with geeks. So you have your whole CI system set up with, um, with scheme and geeks, which is cool. So yeah, there you go. It's a whole CI system with a uh, Guile scheme, which is great. Uh, Dynamo is a music notation editor that provides a convenient interface to the powerful music engraving pro program Lilypond. We might need to skip ahead to the Guile libraries because we're just seeing a bunch of programs at this point. Uh, Fade says, put that link in the show notes. All right, let me do that. Good point. Uh, yes. There we go if I remember to check that in later. Uh, so it's a music notation editor. Um, so if you write sheet music, and I know that some people watching this channel actually have like music degrees uh, or, or studying music degrees, uh, this is something you can use for uh, writing sheet music. And then you can use Lily Pond to um, generate an actual engraving of it, which is basically just the sheet music you would see like an orchestra playing or whatever. So you can uh, use those tools together to do that. And I, I know that Lily Pond is scriptable with Guile and apparently Denimo also is. So that is pretty sweet. Um, all right, so let's skip some stuff here. I'm just gonna skip at my leisure here. Oh, so apparently Dpackage can be scripted with Guile somehow. It has something to do with Guile, interesting. Okay. Oh yeah, Emacsy. Now this is something that's pretty cool. No. Where is the real page for this? Uh, Non-GNU projects. So Emacsy is a uh, library. Have they been updating it here or is it somewhere else? I do not like Savannah. It's just such an ugly website. Sorry to say. If the if the FSF wants to uh, increase the profile of writing free software, I think that the, the first step would be 
getting rid of Savannah and just using Forge Joe instead because Savannah is just not so good. This is definitely not the right one. Where was it? I saw it earlier today. Anyway, the point is, uh, it is a Guile library and also an embeddable C library, which is, makes it possible to plug in Emacs-like behavior into other programs. So all the concepts that you're used to with Emacs, um, they are represented in this Emacs -y library, like key maps, uh, major and minor modes, uh, the mini buffer, macros, history, tab completion, uh, lots of stuff like that. So if you want to write an Emacs-like program, uh, you can use this Emacs -y library to do that. Now, it hasn't really been maintained very uh, consistently. <laughs> I'm sure Dave has some opinions on that. Um, and I think someone recently started picking it back up again. It may be someone who's hung out in this community before. I'm not exactly sure, but um, it, it seems like a really cool library. And if you are interested in this idea, you should consider contributing to it. Uh, Dave says, good luck regarding getting rid of Savannah. I had frustrating experiences with the people that do all the GNU.org stuff 10 years ago when I worked for the FSF. So if, as far as I can tell, not much has changed. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't want to say too much, but I do believe that uh, Savannah is counterproductive to the image of uh, the FSF as a software forge. Okay. So next, uh, let's see, F. Okay, so F.SCM, it's kind of like F in Emacs, right? Yeah, okay, it was initially inspired by the F library for Emacs. That's cool. Mostly written in C, Dave says. Oh, okay. Uh, Fade says, Savannah was a er very early forge and it hasn't changed. Yes, that's true. It's been around for a very long time. Hello to uh, Alpha Papa in the YouTube chat. Okay, so that's probably going to be a useful library if you want to do more than just basic file operations. I haven't actually used that one before. Guile F.SEM. F's in the chat. Now resembles most of the useful functions I find myself needing from time to time. Uh, what hasn't been updated in two years, but that doesn't really mean anything because it's just a file library. So <laughs> thanks, Trev. So yeah, that could be useful. All right, excellent, excellent. We got some Fs in the chat. F to pay re pay your respects. Uh, F disk. So yeah, if you want to destroy your your hard drive and all your partitions, apparently you can script that with F disk. Excellent. Fibers. Now Fibers is a really interesting library. It is a lightweight concurrency library. Uh, someone explained the F meme to fade. Not really worth understanding what F is all about, but uh, yeah, it's just one of those new memes. Yeah, Fibers is a big one. It's kind of important in the Guile space because uh, a lot of really interesting applications can be built on that. Have you ever, ever used uh, languages like uh, ML or Go? And er it mentions Erlang here as well. Um, it's like coroutines where you can have, you know, independent lines of execution in your program or independent call stacks almost. Um, it's also like continuations, and I'm pretty sure that Fibers is probably implemented with continuations because that's kind of how things are done in Scheme. But um, it can help you to write uh, more scalable applications. So it, it uses... So it, it gives you some uh, non-blocking versions of things that you would do in Guile and the ability to write concurrent code that could take advantage of these non-blocking operations. So when I, when I say blocking operation, what I mean is when you make a web request using the built-in HTTP library in Guile Scheme, uh, that call will block on the HTTP request and wait for it to come back before your code will resume. So anywhere you call it out to a server, your code will not resume until that request comes back and you have all the information in your hands. Um, a non-blocking request is one where you make the request and then the code sort of tells the OS, hey, um, I'm, I'm just going to sleep until you notify me that uh, this request is, or the connection is established, et cetera, et cetera. And also any reads, like, so the connection and the, um, the IO reads and writes, et cetera, are all non-blocking. So the OS would just notify the process whenever it's ready to do something again. So that line of execution in the process can then be suspended and then other things can be happening at the same time. 
which increases the amount of parallelism in your program. You can do more things at the same time. This is especially useful for web servers or any kind of networked application that needs to handle a lot of requests at the same time, um, especially like transient requests like an HTTP server. So um, Fibers is a library that gives you this kind of uh, functionality. Wingo Fibers, written by Andy Wingo, who is the, I guess, the main maintainer of Guile and is doing a lot of the forward-looking work in Guile as well as in WebAssembly land. Um, so basically you end up creating channels, kind of like in Go, if you ever used Go before, and you can read and write from channels and it makes your code look synchronous, even though it is asynchronous. And some, some people watching this right now, it's not gonna make any sense to you. You don't need to worry about what this means. Uh, those of you who know, I'm just telling you this exists. So, uh, very useful library if you want to experiment with a concurrent programming model in uh, Scheme using channels. A lot of people use this. A lot of various programs for Guile are using this. I believe that GNU Shepherd, which is a Guile Scheme program, and it is the, the what do you call it, the init system, and also system level service and user level service manager for geeks. Um, I believe it got rewritten recently to use fibers. So there's a lot of interesting stuff to be... Uh, yeah, Shepard uses it. I think, yeah, Goblins uses it. Yep. So there's a lot of a lot of things using Fibers. It's a cool library. I actually tried to use it recently, and it didn't work so well for me, but I think I did something wrong. Uh, Faith says, perhaps a quick explanation of uh, ICE-9. What does ICE-9 stand for? Dave, do you know? I don't know what it means. Why ICE-9? I know it's a Guile thing. Okay. Fictional material that appears in the novel Cat's Cradle. And why? Uh, okay, so the idea was that Guile's module system would crystallize the massive scheme code out there. It didn't happen exactly like that. In practice, Ice-9 is Guile's own namespace. Okay. So yeah, Guile, a lot of things emerged in Guile very early. I mean, as you can see, 1998, you know, like Guile's been around for a while and Scheme has been in active development in, since then. And uh, a module system wasn't really discussed for Scheme until I think R6RS. Let's see, uh, Scheme modules. Yeah, so it's R6RS, I think when this first showed up and that's after the 90s, I wanna say, probably early 2000s. R6RS ratification. Is that what you call it? Yeah, okay. Uh, where's the year? 2007. So modules did not show up in Scheme in, until 2007, and they got changed again in R7RS. <laughs> they says the decision was made like 25 years ago, and we're stuck with that. Yeah, for Guile, that's for sure. So if you see ICE9 and the weird module syntax in... Um, in Guile Scheme, it's because it's been around forever. It's a Kurt Vonnegut reference, yeah. It's not a bad thing to reference, though. I mean, that's kind of cool. But it's very confusing. Anybody who starts using Guile is like, what the hell is this Ice-9 thing? It seems so vague. Why is it not just, like, Guile? Why does it have to be Ice-9? Yes, Dave says, I think Guile should alias the whole name space to Guile and deprecate Ice-9. Yeah, that's the most obvious thing to do. Because so much useful stuff is in there, you know? Like, uh, Ice-9 match. Pattern matching. That should be under Guile match. Or it should just be, like, in the default uh, environment. Because who doesn't want to use match? I guess it probably causes a problem for things like Hoot, though. Yeah, I think everybody who starts using uh, Guile has this question. Like, what the hell is Ice-9? Dave says, uh, it's a good example of being clever that makes things harder to understand. Yes, I think, isn't that just like indicative of 90s? Like, okay, anything up to like the 90s programmer stuff and internet references are all like obscure references to something that, that the average person has no concept about. I think that now that you've got like the uh, JavaScript ecosystem heavy marketing that is trying to get like the masses to use something now we've got you know normal sounding things but uh yeah i think that some of the older tech stuff is 
harder to understand. Is that being clever or just obscure geek? I think that could be the same thing in a lot of ways. Okay, fibers. You should check it out. Free HDL. Uh, okay, so VHDL simulator compiler. Cool. If you're doing hardware design, you might want to check that out. Let's 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 move this along. Uh, whoa. Okay, free talk is a command line Jabber chat client. Mm, scriptable and extensible using Guile. If you want an XMPP client, uh, you can script it with Guile. Benoit says, I find using Guile clever. You mean the name Guile? Yeah. Well, the, the name Scheme has definitely inspired a number of uh, interesting implementation names like Gambit and Guile and uh, Gosh. So, you know, Scheme is a land of cool names, in my opinion. All right. GGOF. This one is pretty useful, I think. Um, we've used it before on the stream. And uh, it is a, a library for interacting with um, GTK, sorry, glib libraries for the, uh, so the Guile object library is basically G object, anything G object, which is the whole range of glib, GTK, etc. So uh, if you want to write a UI application in Guile, you probably want to check out GGOF. There are other GTK and other GLib libraries for Guile, but I think this is the newer one, and it seems to be pretty well designed. I could be wrong about that, but I believe this is the one that people are focused on. So this is like a simple uh, example of creating a uh, GUI app or UI app, and it's not too many lines of code. You get to set up a window, a uh, header bar, title bar. Yeah, just... You know, a very short bit of code. Okay. But um, I'm not going to really go through that. I mean, if we were, if we had time to work on an example, I might try to use it using uh, GGOF plus some other stuff to make a little UI app. Maybe like an IRC client or something. We'll see. GRAP is a tool in Guile Library for generating function wrappers and interlanguage calls. So it was like a uh, swig, I guess. Swig. Yeah, simplified wrapper and interface generator. If, if you used to do um, interfaces between dynamic languages and C libraries, C, C++ libraries back in the 90s or the early 2000s, you probably had to use swig. Uh, these days, I don't really uh, see it being used that much, but maybe it is. <laughs> Why is golf in the name? No idea. <laughs> the name is weird. Fade says, we should have hacker trading cards. Yeah, that would be cool. Uh, we should have hacker NFTs. You want to start a new NFT collection so we can just fleece the entire hacker community? Yeah, it reads like a stutter to me. Yeah, Gagolf. Gagolf. I'm going to go write some ads with Gagolf today. Great. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Oslo says, is Shay a synonym for scheme? Um, no. Shea, Benoit could probably tell us that. Faye could probably tell us that. <clears throat> and Summer could definitely tell us that. Uh, at in the home of. Okay, like home scheme. Something like that. Okay. Gash is a POSIX compatible shell written in Guile scheme. That could be useful. Uh, is Gash the one that's used for Geeks? Okay, Gash is designed to bootstrap Bash as part of the Geeks bootstrap process. Yeah, Gash is not something that you necessarily want to use directly, I think. Um, but maybe later. Early days for Gash. At the moment, Gash is extremely limited and extremely slow. Cannot recommend using it as your shell. It does its bootstrapping job and parser works well for POSIX compatible scripts, but that's about it. So basically, it can execute 
shell scripts, like not bash, but sh. Um, and it's used for the early environment of bootstrapping a geek system. So if you, if you've never thought about what it takes to actually build an entire OS from scratch, including the kernel and all the tools, uh, you basically have to go all the way back to the most basic elements of everything, which is having a C compiler and having some way to, to script the execution of programs. And, uh, Gash is one aspect of the, uh, Geek's bootstrapping process. It's a cool project. Apparently, it's being funded by NLNet, which is really cool. And none of the text. Okay, I'm about to say none of the text shows up. Uh, Gash utils, uh, scheme implementations of many common POSIX utilities. Uh, even has a, an awk implementation. That's cool. So there's a lot of stuff being written in Guile right now. Just just so you know. Let's move on. Uh, Git tiles and Git forge. We talked about that once, but you uh, can't really see it right now. GNU Cache. If you want to have a quick and like experience with free software and make it Guile scriptable, there you go. GNU Cache. GNU Net is is that like a peer to peer uh, <clears throat> uh, network kind of thing? Let's let's move on. Let's move on. GNU TLS might be necessary if you need to make TLS connections to other programs from Guile. Goblins, obviously goblins, which is uh, Transactional distributed programming environment following object capability security designs. Uh, that's going to be playing a much larger role in uh, the scheme development world soon and the general development world. This whole idea of uh, object capability. Oh, Dave, yeah. You, you should uh, propose that to Christine. Just to call it goblins and not just goblins. We don't need that. Trev says, why didn't you tell me about Gash when I brought up SESH? This looks way better. Well, it's not really fully functional for the average daily use yet, I think. But if you contribute to it, maybe it will be. Yeah, if you want to learn more about goblins, uh, the heart of sprightly goblins is a paper written by Christine Limmer Weber, which basically explains top to bottom the whole model. The heart of sprightly, yeah. A lot of stuff in here, lots of nice charts and graphs and examples. So uh, yeah, if you wanna learn what that thing's all about, read that paper. I haven't gotten all the way through it yet, but I do want to. Ah, uh, yes, and Dave says, uh, you should join uh, the Sprightly channel in Libra chat. So if you're already on the System Crafters IRC, you should also join the Sprightly channel because there's a lot of overlap in personnel. Uh, and uh, Dave's also giving in the chat a link to the uh, forum for Sprightly if you want to check out uh, the forum. There's a password involved there, so you, I'll add that too to the show notes, if that's okay, Dave. So if you have other questions about uh, Sprightly... ...then you can go there and ask as well. And there's also a new Goblins release that's coming soon. That sounds exciting. Looking forward to that. Okay, it's going away on, t on February 1st when it opens to the public. Great. So I I'm not going to violate any security protocols by uh, sharing it here. Uh, Trev says, tell us the puns of Sprightly don't s and don't say it's named after Soda. No, it's definitely not named after Soda. Uh, so I think this must be something that comes from Media Goblin. Or I think that, you know, Christine has this sort of ongoing Christine verse. I don't know for sure. This is my assumption. I'm just making assumptions here. But, you know, sprightly goblins. I don't know what the sprightly thing came from, but, you know, there's some, some connection here. Yes, uh, Dave says there's a bunch of lore in all the names, but I'm not the one to tell the story. Yes, we'll have to have uh, Christine on at some point to explain to us the lore of sprightly and the related things. There's also vats for the goblins, so there's a lot of uh, magical, sciencey things happening there. Okay. Dave says, goblins has a spiritual connection to media goblin? Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing there's some kind of lineage there. All right. Guild Hall. Okay, so Guild Hall is probably worth mentioning. Is this the same one, though? So there's, there's Guild Hall and there's Guile Hall. Are they the same thing? I'm guessing the answer is no. 
Maybe it's a newer iteration of the same idea. Guildhall used to be the thing that you would use for Guile Scheme programs before Geeks came about. Um, so basically, it's a way to develop uh, Guile applications in a more structured way. But I think that this Guile Hall may be the more recent thing. And we did show it on a stream recently. So maybe it is... Uh, what you should use instead. I don't know though. You should check them both and see which one works better for you. Yeah, Dave says Guildhall is still a thing as far as I know, but I don't use it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Geeks does well enough. Uh, uh, Fake Baka, Fake Baka. I don't know if, if I'm saying that name right. Uh, Golf is Guile Object Library 4. Okay, so it's like a prefix, but it's still Gagolf. Uh, oh, Guile Emacs. Okay, yeah. This is Emacs with a few settings that make working with... Oh, no, wait, what? I don't understand. Emacs with a few settings that make working with Guile easier for people new to Emacs. I'm guessing it's a prepackaged config for working with Guile or something. Finally, we've made it to the Guile libraries. After an hour of talking about programs that use Guile, now we're going to talk about the Guile libraries, finally. All right. Um, AA tree is a self balancing binary data structure for Guile. Non mutating insert, delete, and search operations. So this is like a persistent tree structure or something. I'm guessing. I haven't heard about AA trees, but maybe that's something that's covered in uh, the Okasaki uh, data structures, purely functional data structures. Another four hours of going over this. Yeah. It will be another four hours to get through this whole list. <clears throat> So worth, worth looking in, into this if you are interested in a, uh, an immutable or persistent self-balancing binary tree. Get the Guile AA tree library. Guile A spell if you want to have spell correction in your programs. I don't need it because I spell perfectly. Except for all the words that a s spell checker would trip over that programmers have to deal with all the time. Um, Guile Avahi. I guess that's how you pronounce that. Uh, Avahi Client Library, implementation of multicast DNS. Is that like a local service discovery thing? I can't remember what Avahi is all about, but if you need to use that for some kind of program you're writing, then it's there. Uh, Guile AWS, a DSL for a number of the Amazon web services, including EFS, EC2, Route 53, and more. Uses the Guile compiler tower to generate the DSL from the AWS JSON specifications. Okay, so it sounds like... <laughs> it sounds like the... Uh, it, it down levels scheme code to um, the actual AWS service configuration stuff, or maybe even calls to the web services. Uh, Dave says, Guile AWS is great. It's a Ricardo project. Ricardo is one of the uh, maintainers of Geeks, I believe, if he's still one of the maintainers. Tobias. Uh, Peter says, Avahi, isn't that the zero comp network thing like Bonjour? Yeah, I think so. And uh, Ashra says, next time we spend one hour to write a randomizer for the list, then 40 minutes to troubleshoot, and 10 minutes with random packages until the last 10 minutes the battery suddenly dies. Yeah, that sounds like a system crap for stream, doesn't it? I'm sorry, folks. I mean, like, <laughs> why do you watch this crap? Guile Bash. Provides a shared library and set of Guile modules allowing you to extend Bash and Scheme. Why bother? Just don't write Bash. If you want to write Scheme, write Scheme. If we need, like, Guile libraries that make writing Bash-like scripts easier, then we should just do that. Dave says, Ricardo started... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Guile AWS after looking at an unreleased AWS plus Guile project of mine, uh, which he links to in the chat. Um, Guile Cloud Formation. Cool. Bash, just don't. Yeah, we need a bumper sticker with that. Eric says in the chat, hey, Eric, uh, I'm sad I missed when you covered Fennel. Yes, I know. I thought about you because a long time ago you were telling me how you wanted to configure Awesome WM with, uh, with Fennel. Uh, currently, among other things, working on a Geeks-inspired package manager wrapper. Yeah, that we've been talking about that a little bit elsewhere, too. That's kind of a good idea, I think. Ashra says, don't bash bash. 
Uh, Fade says, any shell script longer than 14 lines should be recast in a real programming language. Yeah, well, if it's literally just launching programs the whole time and just looping things and to launch programs, then it's fine to be a script. But if you're starting to do like, you know, processing of files and stuff with Bash, get out. <laughs> Trev says, the golden rule was five lines and switched to Perl, I thought. Um, can't say I've written much Perl, but I don't think it's something I want to do. Uh, Guile Cairo wraps the Cairo graphics library for Guile Scheme. I've actually used this before. I don't know where the code is for that, but um, I was writing some code to generate System Crafters thumbnails uh, using this. So, uh, cool library. Uh, I believe that Andy Wingo wrote this, at least the beginning versions of it. Uh, Nongnu.org Guile Cairo. Mm, yes, this looks like an Andy Wingo uh, formatted page here. Documentation. Anyway, if you want to do like graphic stuff and save it to files with uh, with Guile Scheme, definitely check out this library. I did find that it was kind of hard to find stuff in this documentation for things I might want to do. Maybe that was just my experience at the time, but it might take a little bit of effort. Uh, the nice thing also is a lot of these libraries, I think they actually have info files that show up in the uh, info system. So instead of going to a website, you can just pull them up. Yeah, like fibers. Here it is. So the, the fibers info page is here inside of Emacs. So you don't need to leave Emacs. You can read the manuals for the various libraries here um, in the info system. Guile Seabor, concise binary object re representation. It's a binary data serialization format, similar to JSON, but serializes the binary. So one of the many, many binary packing serialization algorithms, apparently. But this has an RFC, so it's not like a message pack, which probably doesn't have an RFC. I don't know if you care about those things. Message pack is probably more common, though. Dave says, yeah, most Guile libraries have info manuals, so excellent Emacs integration. Yes. Fade says, I wish everything was an in info. Info is nice. Uh, one thing I would like to do when, if I write any books, which I intend to, and I keep talking about it, but I never end up finishing one, uh, I want to also distribute a copy as an info document so it can be read in Emacs. I think that should be kind of cool. But uh, the, the official version of the book would have to be a 50 pound hardcover book that um, has mostly blank pages and just like the actual content of the book in the middle. I might have to like get a custom publisher to help me with that, but I just want to make sure that any book I write is the biggest possible book on your bookshelf so that I look like I'm the most prolific author, even though it's no content at all. All right. Um, Guile charting, uh, Guile scheme library to create bar charts and graphs using Cairo. Okay. Could be useful, especially if you want to, uh, please your pointy haired boss with whatever programs you're writing. Uh, Guile Colorize provides you with a colorized REPL for Guile. Cool. Common Mark. If you need to deal with markdown files, then you might want to look at this Common Mark library. Um, it can make it easier to parse things. I believe that the Haunt um, Static Site Generator by Dave here is uh, is using Guile Common Mark for the markdown support. Dave says, if you've ever looked at graphs in Andy Wingo's blog post, that's using Guile Charting. Cool. Nice. All right, uh, Guile Config is a library providing a declarative approach to application configuration specification. That's a mouthful. Library provides clean configuration declaration forms and processes that take care of configuration, file creation, configuration, file parsing, command line parser, perimeter parsing using git, opt long, basic GNU, command line parser, parameter generation, help usage version, automatic output generation for the above the command line parameters. I had to read that like it was a uh, gambling ad disclaimer because obviously it's too complicated to read it and not trip over every single word. Um, yeah, so if you want to have a program that can be configured using Guile as a configuration language, then that sounds like a pretty useful thing. Guile curl is a project that has procedures that allow Guile to do client-side URL transfers. Basically just wraps uh, the curl library for um, better HTTP support. So it's probably good to use that if you really need some heavy duty HTTP library interaction. Unlike what comes built into Guile, there are HTTP 
libraries in Guile, but they're probably not super rich. So you might need something that uses curl instead. Dave says, you sound like that part in Alice's restaurant when Arlo Guthrie is in the group W bench. Now that is a reference I don't get. Guile CV is a computer vision library. All right, nice. Vigra. If it, it's missing one letter to look like something else, that uh, confused me for a second. Guile Daemon is a small Guile program that loads your initial configuration file, then reads and evaluates Guile expressions. Oh, okay. That's kind of cool. I mean, it's probably not very much code. It, it's effectively a program that listens on a pipe, and you send it scheme forms, and it runs them, which sounds kind of scary, <laughs> to be honest. Uh... But I guess that okay. Uh, anyway, <laughs> running any guile code or scheme code in a, an interpreter could be like that. So I don't really know if it's any different than just running a program. Uh, okay, so guile DBI provides a community interface to SQL databases. However, um, that seems like it's only for guile 2.2. I don't know if this is what people are normally using now. Guile Debugs is a library to communicate with a debug, Debugs bug tracker S SOAP service. Oh boy. I'm sure that uh, someone's PTSD is kicking in talking about SOAP here. So Debugs, if you don't know, is the bug tracker that's being used for Emacs and for geeks. But it's, it originates from the Debian project. That's why it's called Debugs. I don't really know much about it. Aside from the fact that it's supremely old. <laughs> Dave says that Gunn's message comes across strange if you don't get the reference. Yes, but I like the ambiguity there. <laughs> okay, so Guile DNS is a DNS library. All right, cool. If you need that, there you go. I'm going to scroll a little bit here. Oh, so system uh, Guile email is kind of cool. Collection of uh, email utilities implemented in pure Guile. So... I think this is related to, um, it's coming to me, Arun Isaac. Arun Isaac is writing uh, basically a Git forge that pulls together a bunch of different tools. I think it's supposed to be for geeks, but uh, .NET, is that right? There we go. There we go. Um, uh, what is this? Is this a talk? Cool. Okay. There's there's a video you can watch. Uh, this is what I'm looking for. Geeks Forge. Uh, Geek service that lets you run a complete software forge in the manner of GitHub, GitLab, etc. It's not a monolith. It's an assemblage of several pieces of software. Anyway, it's probably also mostly written in Guile, or at least the wiring together of all the stuff. So um, I think it's not super rich yet, but worth keeping an eye on. Uh, Dave says, yeah, Tissue is an Arun Isaac project. Uh, Tissue works well if you don't have any intention of letting the outside world file issues. Yeah, so Tissue, I believe, is a an issue tracking system where the issues are actually checked into the Git repo. Which is an interesting idea. And if you've ever used Fossil before, the Fossil... It's not right, is it? That can't be it. Gene network. Okay. Yeah. I think that's the right one. Yeah. Fossil allows you to keep, uh, you know, a lot of stuff inside of your repo, which is pretty cool. But Fossil is not Git and it requires you to learn a completely different way of working with rep code repositories. So it's not really practical to get people involved. But this is a tissue issues page. And you can't scroll to the end. I think it keeps auto-loading everything next, but I want to see the actual repo for this. Is it here? Okay, this is a website for Tissue. Come on. Click. I think his website must be self-hosted. It's a little bit slow. 
So yeah. Browse Git repository. Separation of discussion of issues from the documentation of issues. Issues are gem text files, which I think is a very interesting idea. If you know what gem text is, or if you don't know what it is, it's the format used for Gemini web pages. So Gemini gem text. Very simple textual format, um, but very effective if you just need links and basic formatting. So uh, I think it's an interesting idea to use that as the format for uh, markup because it simplifies a lot of things. Anyway, Geeks Forge is kind of an inter interesting idea. Keep an eye on that. Let's see. Next. Uh, Guile Eris is a guile implementation of the encoding for robust immutable storage. It allows arbitrary content to be encoded to uniformly sized encrypted blocks that can be reassembled using a short read ability. I don't know much about that. It sounds like a like IPFS, but maybe maybe not exactly like that. Guile FFI FFTW uh, set of Guile bindings for FFTW libraries Guru interface interface. I don't know what that is. What is FFTW? Uh, okay, it's another kind of like math library. Uh, discrete Fourier transform library. Okay, that makes sense. Guile file names manipulate uh, tools for manipulating. <coughs> excuse me, manipulating file names. All right, Guile file system utility functions that augment Guile support for handling files and their names. We're gonna see a lot of file system libraries here in the uh, section of F prefixed libraries, which uh, makes sense because you need to do a lot of that. Dave says, Eris plus Geeks has been explored. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, if you want to have like a, a file storage. <laughs> Peter says, fastest FFT in the West. Now now we see Peter talking on, on two different chat protocols. Um, so yeah, definitely, if you're writing like practical programs, the stuff that comes in Guile for file management is pretty bare bones. So oftentimes you'll end up reaching for a library to do things a little bit more. Um, in a little bit more of a convenient way, I would say. Galgcrypt says uh, it's, it's a subset of the libgcrypt library. So if you want to encrypt some stuff with Guile, then you could probably use that. Uh, GDBM key value storage system. Don't know what that is. GDBM. Whoopsie. Database functions that use extensible hashing and work similar to DBM. All right. I don't know what DBM is, but... That exists. Guile GI is a library for Guile that uses, uh, it's another G object introspection library. Is that the one that I used? Guile GI. I can't remember which one it was now. Maybe I'm wrong about Gagolf. Maybe I used Guile GI. It could have been this. Maybe this is the one that people are using now. Anyway, check that out too. If you want to use, if you want to write uh, GTK apps, maybe G Guile GI would be uh, a bit better. Uh, Guile Git, if you want to use libgit2 directly, you can do that. Maybe you want to write your own Git interface uh, in Guile, which could be cool. Uh, GitLab library, probably for talking to the APIs, cool. Trev says Guile gastrointestinal. Yeah, you might have a gastro gastrointestinal event using some of these libraries. Guile GNOME, basically wrappers for various different uh, GNOME things, but this is Guile 2.2, so kind of outdated. I would guess some of these other G object libraries are more appropriate for that. Guile Hall, okay. Command line application, a set of Guile libraries that allow you to quickly create and publish Guile projects. Uh, allows you to transparently support the GNU build system, yada yada. That's the one that I showed the link for before. I believe that one is probably a good starting point if you want to um, scaffold a new Guile project, especially if it has uh, C code components involved. Fade says, do major Guile releases break backward compatibility with itself? I think that um, the major version bumps often have big changes to the internal functioning. I know that Andy goes to great lengths to not break things. I've seen some videos where like the um, GNU lightning stuff for JIT compilation of Guile code, um, there was a lot of talk about how to do that without breaking stuff. I think that was in the Guile 2 transition, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know what happened in Guile 3. Maybe Dave can correct me on that, but...
but yeah, there, there are changes. There may be minor things that break, but I believe in large part, they try to make sure that things don't break majorly across major version bumps. But I think, you know, at some point, maybe for Guile 4 and above, there should be some breaks because if we want to have Guile be not mainstream per se, but a bit more approachable to people who are, who are coming from established ecosystems, um, maybe uh, cleaning some things up would be nice, like the whole Ice 9 situation. Uh, maybe provide some better library functions for standard things. Like there shouldn't be so many external file libraries. I think some of these things should be built in at, on some level. That's just my uh, opinion. Gun says, slowly coming to the end of the first part. Next episode, Guile H2P. Nah, nah, nah. We're not going to do that again. In fact, since we got 10 minutes here, I should probably just quickly scan through and point out anything that's legitimately interesting. Like a Guile ICS. Maybe somebody cares about that, but not me. Let's see. Okay, Guile IRC. I actually do use this, and it's pretty cool. Um, it's not working right now. Well, it is working right now. When you see the little chat stuff pop up on the screen, if it pops up, somebody in the IRC say something. Um, but when you see the chat pop up on the screen on the stream, yes, like that. Thank you, Ashraz. Um, that's actually coming from Guile IRC because I'm using Guile IRC to connect to Libra Chat in the System Crafters Dash Live channel, and then I'm hosting a web page. Um, from inside of Guile Scheme that the browser view in OBS is connecting to and displaying web page that then pulls an endpoint in Guile to get all the IRC messages and show them on the screen. And when the Twitch integration works, which is not working right now, I don't know if they broke something after all the layoffs. The, the one person who managed the IRC back in is gone probably. Um, when that works, then any of the Twitch chat messages show up on the screen too. So anyway... Guile IRC is pretty useful if you want to write like an IRC bot of some sort. Um, Guile JSON, you're definitely going to want to use that if you're writing um, code that accesses web services or maybe exposes a web service. For sure, you'll want to use that. There's also a Jot library in case you need to do any kind of authentication, JSON web, to web tokens. Uh, let's see, Guile Lib it has a lot of uh, useful stuff in there. This is kind of a dumping ground for common libraries that you might want to use. So that's something to look, in look into if you want. Guile Mastodon can uh, help you to write a Fediverse app, which is interesting. Gun says, is that a JQ rewrite in Guile? I don't know. Uh, let's see. It could be. Netlink. Okay. Let's see. Um, Newt. If you want to write uh, like an in cursive style applications in Guile, use Guile Newt. They use that for the graphical installer for geeks, I think. Uh, there's a pretty robust OpenGL library for Guile that I've used before. It's actually quite cool because um, it has some macros that are able to uh, access vertex arrays directly to, like, it. it's hard to explain. It's, it's some very sophisticated syntax definition work that can um, very efficiently access uh, OpenGL buffers. I was I was pretty impressed with some of that stuff that I read in there. Another Andy Wingo thing. Uh, Dave says Gal Netlink is a wish a lib I wish I had in 2015 when writing Geeks to container support would have allowed lots of cool network containerization stuff right away. Well, that sounds cool. I, I want to hear more about that. Let's see. Uh, Gal PG if you want to use uh, Postgres databases, but that's Gal 2.0. It says, I am also now a, main, now a maintainer of Guile OpenGL. Well, that does make sense, doesn't it? Is Guile parted the same as G parted? I think G parted is GNU parted. Isn't it? Oh, it's, or is it graphical or GTK parted? Yes, yeah, different thing. Uh, Guile present defines a declarative vocabulary for pre presentations. Uh, is that what Andy Wingo uses for his presentations? I don't know. Redis library, SDL libraries, uh, semantic version handling libraries. 
Uh, Dave says, yes, it is what Andy uses. Uh, Andy Wingo's uh, presentation slides always have a very consistent format. If you ever look at the uh, blog post on his site where he's talking about some of his talks he's given, uh, they have a very common look, and that's probably why, because he wrote his own tool for that. I'm guessing he wrote that. SQLite 3 bindings, um, a bunch of Surfy implementations. So if you don't know what a Surfy is, basically Scheme is a core language specification and any language extensions are separate specifications called SRFI, uh, Scheme Requests for Implementation, I think. What does Surfy stand for? No, not squash rackets. Scheme requests for implementation. If you check out the site, you can see the whole list of surfies for various different things. There's all kinds of stuff in there. Some of them are not implemented. They're just like proposals, but some are actually accepted, like the ones that are green, I think. They're accepted, and um, some scheme implementations have libraries for them. <laughs> Fate says, scheme requests for further incompatibility. Yeah, that is kind of like that. But uh, there are many uh, surfy libraries you can pull down for Guile. Well, not that many, as it, stand, as it stands. SSH library, syntax highlighting library, uh, let's see. WebSocket library, I think that might be a Dave Thompson jam there. I've used that a little bit, it's cool. Uh, Guile WM, which is old project, um, it may still work, it's in the Geeks package repo, but uh, it's a window manager with Guile. Uh, Guile script is actually a uh, compiler that compiles Guile code to JavaScript um, if you want to write Guile code for the browser. But you don't really need to do that anymore because Guile Hoot is going to uh, make that a whole lot more mm, streamlined and modern. Uh, Dave says, Guile WM isn't something to use now, but the way it's implemented is genius and something to copy wherever possible. Well, now you maybe want to go check out the code for that. Geeks, yes, I think we might have heard, heard that before. Geeks data service, uh, let's see. Ah. Geeks module command. Environment modules, manipulate software environment. Okay, different thing. So now we've reached the end of the G's. Now we're in the H's. Uh, let's talk about Haunt before we leave because that's pretty useful. Um, it's also by Dave Thompson. See, that's why it's nice to have Dave around here because Dave kind of knows a thing or two about Guile. Uh, let's see, uh, Haunt the Thompson. Haunted Thompson. Wow, it's not even showing up. Uh, D Thompson.us. Let's just go to the direct website and look for Haunt right there, okay. Yeah, also go to, to Dave's website and look at the other stuff that he has written. Uh, Haunt is a static site generator written in Guile Scheme. If you want to uh, have a statically generated website and you want to use Scheme to write the code for it, uh, check it out. It's pretty cool, actually. Uh, a lot of the Geeks websites are written with Haunt. Um, I think the Sprightly Institute website is written with Haunt. I think Dave's own website is written with Haunt. There's a number of websites around that you can find that are written with Haunt. And um, actually, the Geeks website, <clears throat> excuse me, is a good example of this, <clears throat> excuse me, because you don't really know like what the, where is the, ah, thanks Dave. Awesome.haunt.page. In fact, let me put that in the show notes because you'll want to check these out to see sort of what's possible with Haunt as a static site generator. Yes, looks like the most complex Haunt website. I saw a lot of stuff in there that was pretty cool. Let's see, where is it at? It is in, it's not, is it in apps? Blog, uh, media, base. Like this is a full scheme program that generates a website. There's a lot of stuff in here. I'm, I'm trying to look for, ah, what's the other? Uh, Geeks birthday event git. Where is that? Anyway, go check out the source code. I can't 
remember where I saw all this stuff, but they've got a way that they've basically created records for a lot of the stuff they want to display on the site. So it's really easy to maintain certain information that's being displayed. Oh, I think here's one right here. They're defining a record type for publications. And then um, they've got a lot of code for rendering these things. So that's types. It's very well organized, as you can see. There's a subsection of the site, a site that has types, utils, and uh, builder plus templates. So uh, this is the SXML code for generating the view for a playlist preview. So it's like a full application, even though it's a statically generated website. Definitely worth checking out uh, some haunt sites because they are more like scheme programs than um, websites that are written with like Hugo or something. They just uh, eat, eat uh, markdown files and poop out HTML. Sorry for that uh, crude explanation. Anything else worth looking at? Because I have to go now. Let's see. Ba, 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 ba. I'm sure I've forgotten lots of things. So if anybody wants to comment on the stream recording, uh, please feel free to let us know about other cool things for Guile. Uh, Mcron, which is basically a cron program that you can figure with Scheme. I've used that before. Kind of cool. Uh, Mess is also very cool. I think it's a Scheme implementation, but it's very, very low level. And also a C compiler. I think that Akites might be working on that. I don't know if Akites is still here, though. Dave says Geeks uses Mcron. That's true. It's true. Uh, Nomad uh, is an Emacs-like web browser. So if you think about something like Nixt, which is a web browser written with Common Lisp, Nomad is a similar idea, but it's written with Guile Scheme. But I don't think it's uh, maintained. I would love to see that actually get revived and someone make a, a real Guile-based uh, hacker's web browser. But that's, that's a heavy project, as you can tell with what uh, Nix is doing. There's a lot of code involved. A lot of other stuff here. Scheme, byte structures. Uh, yeah, I think that's something you can use to, to manipulate C style data structure directly in memory, which can be useful if you want to interrupt with uh, C programs and not have to uh, do really silly things. Yeah, Dave says an indie web browser is a big lift. Yes, it, it's it's a little bit overwhelming, I think. It sounds easy in, 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 uh, in theory, but in practice, not so easy. Yeah, Fade says just the JavaScript support alone is a major project. Well, we're not talking about like writing a new engine. A lot of these things just use WebKit GTK, but writing the shim that gets inserted into the into every page so that you have the ability to like do all the nifty little follow link prefixes and stuff. Like there's, that's a lot of stuff in there. Some more surfy stuff. Struct pack uh, for working with packed byte structures. Uh, that also could be useful for working with uh, data that's been written from a C++, C++, C++ program. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce this, this name. Chukandere. I don't know. It's a game engine, but it's more like for uh, visual novels. So if you've ever played any of those kind of anime looking games that you see on, on Steam or even things like, uh, what is it called? The, the Boyfriend Simulator. Not a game that I have played, and I'm not joking when I say I haven't played it. I haven't played that, but uh, that's kind of that kind of game where it's just like static graphics and there's mostly conversations going on. <laughs> Dave says, how much could one web browser cost? $10? Yeah. All right. WeChat. Apparently, you can script WeChat in Guile. Cool. Yes. Uh, as Dave says, uh, that uh, Gabe engine is cool. It's made by Lily P from the Geeks community. Yes. Uses Guile SDL to, SDL2 Wisp. Check out Wisp um, if you want a Python style syntax for Scheme. I'm not going to go into detail on that, but you can see a kind of a comparison here. Basically, it's just uh, uses white space to delineate the groupings, plus some other inserted syntax for various different things like nested groupings. So it's cool. I think we skipped over SDL2. It's in here. SDL2, it's right there. Yeah, it's there. Um, Xyle on Guile, okay. Uh, Z Rhythm, it's a...
I never typed that correctly. It's an it's a more uh, recent DAW digital audio workstation for people who want to make electronic music or even uh, electronic music. Um, and it can be scripted in Guile. Uh, the uh, author of this program, Alex, I don't know if his name is here. Yeah, uh, uh, Alexandros, um, also is a contributor to Geeks, I believe. And uh, uh, some portion of this program is written in Guile, I think. So that's pretty cool. Ah, and that's the end. Okay, so I made it, more or less. We skipped some things, but it's not too bad. Let me just make sure I have, haven't missed anything in the chat, and then we'll shut her down. Let's see, where am I? Uh, Damon is came in the chat on YouTube. Uh, I want to try Emacs, but don't know how I can get how I can't how can I? Can anyone help me? Yeah, watch the videos on this channel. Absolute beginner's guide to Emacs. Maybe it will help. I don't know. Okay. Uh, Amalveja says, any ML-specific libraries in Scheme? Yeah, there's some stuff that, that's in this list. Uh, search for OpenCog, I think. There's a lot of stuff around. Uh, yes, DJ Cthulhu says, I'll have to check out Z-Rhythm. Yeah, I want to play with it more. Uh, in the IRC side, uh, let's see. Ah, uh, yes, Dave says, the heart of sprightly uh, white paper uses Wisp. Yes. Some love it, some hate it. I think it's cool. I actually would like to write a little bit of code with it because I think it's, it's kind of nice actually to have that syntax. And Dave says, yeah, I've heard System Crafters is where it's at, the coolest place on the net. Not the coolest, but you know, cool enough. We've got a lot of cool people to hang out. We make jokes all day long. We probably uh, cost companies a lot of money for all the wasted time. Landfill says, my brother made the Z-Rhythm website. That's cool. It's a nice website. Okay, so hopefully that little walk through all of the programs and libraries related to the Guile was helpful to sort of show you that um, learning Guile actually would be useful if you want to hack on some cool stuff. It's a way to use Scheme in a more practical um, sense. And um, there's a you know fairly large community around Guile, especially you know with things like Geeks, etc. Um, so. It, it should give you a little bit more of an impetus to learn Guile, I think, if you want to learn a scheme, if you want to try it out. Uh, there's lots of stuff you can do. I definitely think that doing a little bit of game development with Scheme is a good way to warm up to it. Um, probably there will be a spring Lisp game jam uh, sometime. So it was in May last year, it seems. Probably will be around a similar time frame this year if if people are... If Dave and uh, Technomancy organize it at some point, who knows when that will happen. But anyway, point being, if you want a cool way to learn Scheme, I would say my suggestion is to do the Lisp Game Jam whenever it happens and um, use Chickadee as a library. Dave says, there will be one approximately April or May. I will definitely be involved in that, uh, writing some kind of game for it and streaming it. So typical thing that I do. All right. So let me know what you think about uh, all the stuff we saw here today in the comments. If you have any comments or, you know, find me on the places that I hang out and let me know there. Um, I'll commit these show notes so that you have access to the links that we talked about today in case you want to check those out. Um, and yeah, let me know also what ideas maybe you have for the stream next week, what things you might want to talk about. Um, I have some ideas that people had sent me before, but keep sending them because there's many things that we can do. All right, folks, thank you so much for being here today. Really appreciate your, uh, your attendance and your attention. Uh, and until next time, happy hacking. We'll see you. Oh, hope you have a great weekend. See you.